everyone, this is Josh Tiltner. I am a Nuxt ambassador as well as an instructor over at Mastering Nuxt. I started programming for about 30 years ago. I first started out with software and then I slowly migrated over to web technologies. I'm pretty active over at Twitter. You can reach me at Josh Deltner. I also have a website with a, a bunch of tutorials on Nuxt at deltner.com. My talk is about enterprise plugin patterns. We use Nuxt uh, where I work at realtruck.com. Uh, we've been using it for about four years now, powering eight large e-commerce websites. Uh, in those four years, we've learned a lot about Nuxt and different ways to uh, deal with third-party integrations. And that's the center of this talk today. First off, third-party code is poison. Let's figure out how we can solve that problem. But first, let's get to know third-party code. It could be a lot of different things. Um, remarking tracking pixels. Um, for example, if you view a product, let's say it's a mud flap or something, um, a lot of people want to know what that thing is that you're looking at so they can remark it to you on Facebook or other places. Likewise, it could be a widget on your website. Um, such as a chat provider, maybe some pop-ups, reviews, or payments. It could be an integration, uh, such as analytics or tag containers, or even A-B testing tools. And of course, all of them want to be the first to load, and they all claim they don't affect site performance. So usually when you integrate these providers into your code base, uh, if you use View Meta, it'll look something like this. Now, this is a simple chat example, um, just using the head function and a script tag. And if you need to do something more advanced, let's say you have a, a function that you need to fire as soon as tracker is loaded, um, you have to do a couple other steps in here. Uh, you have to define the inner HTML uh, for the JavaScript section you want to execute, as well as add dangerously disable sanitizers by tag ID. It sounds kind of ominous, and it kind of should be. Um, it lets you know that you're doing something a little bit weird. So why is that bad? If you have this type of code in your pages, layouts, or components, uh, to me, it poisons the purpose of your pages. Um, their job should be to render a user interface for your customers so they can view your website. They shouldn't have to be dealing with initializing third-party stuff or having any of that code in any of those layers. Likewise, the object structure is kind of confusing, um, especially with the dangerously disabled stuff um, and the different IDs you have to put in. Um, it's really hard to navigate about. It's also error-prone. Um, it's really easy to, to do something wrong with that type of a structure because it's, again, confusing. And it's not maintainable at scale. Uh, for us, we have about 20 or more integrations uh, at Realtruck. And so imagine what the layout would look like, or let's say the pages would look like with all that JavaScript trying to spin up and do different things. So how do we fix it? With plugins. So as a reminder, Nuxt plugins are, they're just injected JavaScript functions. Uh, they're ran once uh, per hit on the server, and then again when the app starts up on the browser. And they're exposed to all pages and layouts. And even better, they're exposed to the context object. So almost everywhere in Nuxt, you can use these, and they're globally available. So what would this look like? This is our tracker example uh, in a plugin. Again, it's just an exported function. And since we're not using view meta, we're having to add the script tag ourselves and attach it to head. Uh, it's not so bad. You just use document.createElement, add the source, attach it to the head. And then since we're inside of a function, we have to use window.initTracker. This is what it used to look like. It's kind of chaotic um, and hard to reason about. And compare that to this, which is the function we just looked at. To me, this is a lot easier to consume. 
So first off, it's very focused. Uh, I like having one integration per file. So for example, if something was going wonky with the, the chat provider, I know exactly where to go. I'll look at the chat plugin. Same thing with Google Analytics. It's really easy to know where your stuff is. It's also just JavaScript. You know, since you're not doing stuff inside ViewMeta, um, you have that JavaScript right there. So you can do whatever you need to do, we'll call whatever function. It's really easy. Likewise, it's really flexible. Uh, you can do a whole bunch of stuff inside of the plugin, uh, such as lazy loading. Second problem I want to talk about is changing service providers is a pain. So for us, it's just a matter of when, not if. Um, you could be moving from live person to drift uh, for chat, for example, or even payment providers moving from Stripe to Bolt. Likewise, take containers may change, going from Google Tag Manager over to Segment. These are all changes that we actually went through. So after they started changing a couple of times, we wanted to find a way for us to kind of protect the rest of our code base against change, especially with third parties. So how do we fix it? You may have guessed. Abstractions. Using plugins. So why would you want to use abstractions? Well, first off, uh, if you have external integrations that may change in the future, if you want to protect the rest of your code base from those changes, abstractions may be a good thing for you. Likewise, if you have a feature that's fulfilled by different providers, abstractions are really handy. For our code base that runs eight sites, a given chat provider may change between two individual sites. So abstractions help us to fulfill the feature from an external standpoint by still leaving the implementations inside of a plugin. And last, you want a clean line of separation between your code and third-party code. Uh, when you have abstractions, it's really easy to know uh, where your code stops and where the other code starts. So how do we create one? Um, it's really a couple steps. Just map out the basic interface you want to talk to. Create a plugin using the interface. Update view components to use the plugin. So let's look at step number one, map out the interface. When you're doing this, try not to think about the current implementation. You don't want to uh, kind of poison your train of thought. You should think about it more from a generic standpoint. If I had a whatever, what would that need? So a really simple example would be a chat provider. Maybe it has one thing and that's just to open the dialogue. You know, it's a really simple example, but one that we actually went through. We don't want to think about all the different ways that our current implementation needed to open that pop-up or open chat. Uh, we just wanted to think about it, uh, again, very generically. So the second step is to create a plugin using the interface. So here, it's just a injected chat object with a function called open. And so that's the abstraction point. Uh, that's the point where it abstracts. So from there on on, it's just the internal code uh, for accomplishing whatever it needs to do. So in this case, uh, the bottom code, which I kind of shaded out because it's really not important, but whatever provider you have, whatever integration it may be, you're probably going to have to add some JavaScript to spin it up, uh, to call some functions or what have you, maybe some configurations. Uh, but in this case, if we want to call open, it's just going to call drift API open chat. So this is what the abstraction looks like in the actual uh, template section. Uh, it's really simple. It's literally chat.open. And let's pretend this is a chat button. It doesn't have to care about how to spin up Drift or what the actual function call is for Drift. It's using the abstraction, which is really, really nice. So we don't have vendor-specific code in this component. Uh, it's very simple. It's your own stuff. Likewise, you can switch chat providers, and this code doesn't have to change. So imagine a scenario where you have chat in the footer, you have a chat button, you have a chat in a menu, 
all those things can just call chat.open. And if you were to change chat providers, none of those would have to change. So the third problem is marketing wants to track everything. Ain't that the truth? So not only do they want to chat things like product list viewed, but category viewed, product viewed, so on and so forth. It just keeps on piling all these different events, all these different payloads, and all this different information. It gets kind of crazy. Even worse than that, uh, multiple third parties want to know about these different events. When you click chat, for example, maybe segment needs to know about it because it's going to talk to other integrations. Likewise, full story might be concerned about that because it's trying to figure out whether or not people are using chat effectively. And you may even be doing some A-B testing. So optimizely might be concerned whether or not you're clicking chat. So that's a lot of stuff. How do you control all of it? How do you fix it? By using the event bus. And of course, still using plugins. So here's how it works. Integrations subscribe to events they care about. So for example, segment cares about chat clicked and purchased. Full story cares about purchased and nav clicked. Your code will emit events to the bus. It won't talk to any of these directly. So when you click on the button, it's gonna say, hey, somebody click chat. And then subscribers send the info to their servers. Segment got it, full story got it. So that's cool. How do you make one? So here we can just use, again, a plugin. And this uses MIT as an emitter. It's really, really small, has a on and emit. And the reason we're doing this is because Vue uh, removes some of these functionalities uh, when it changed to Vue 3. So if you're using Vue 2, you can just use literally new view, and that is your bus. It already has on and already has emit from the view instance. But for view three, you just use uh, mit. It's really, really simple. So here's an example of a Google Analytics plugin. It's just listening for the chat clicked event. Uh, it's expecting a location to be passed to it. And then it's going to do whatever it needs to uh, to send that event to Google. Likewise, here's an example of full story, taking the same event and sending it to full story the way that it needs to do it. So this is what it would look like when you have all that put together. Somebody clicks on a chat button, it opens up the chat through the plugin that we already established. And then we can tell people about it using the event bus. And we can pass that this happens to be in the header, for example. So one word of caution, this really isn't for component communication. That's an anti-pattern. What it's really for is to sending these events to your third-party integrations. If at any point you find your code relying on these events to actually do real work, you're going down the wrong path. Uh, likewise, you should be able to take these events uh, these emits and these ons and remove them from your code base. And if your application um, starts to have errors, then you know you're probably relying on those events the wrong way. So one thing I wanted to mention, uh, again, I'm an instructor over at Mastering Nuxt. Uh, we have 95 video lessons, 10 hours of content, and a Discord channel. And 25% of all sales go directly to Nuxt. And the code base will be updated to Nux3 when that becomes stable. And that's all I had for you today. Again, I'm Josh Deltner. You can reach me at Josh Deltner on Twitter. And again, my website is deltner.com. Hope you enjoyed my talk, and I'll see you at the conference. Mm -hmm.